Hello everyone! Sorry for the delay getting started, you know, you gotta love technology with a live broadcast. You'd never, ever know what's gonna happen, so we're just rolling with the punches here. Uh, but we're gonna kick off today's show notes here. As you notice, I am still, uh, I'm not working from my, my lovely studio uh, up in Temecula, but I'm here at the offices of the Museum of Making Music, where tomorrow night you'll be able to see David Castaneda perform on our on our very own stage here, and we're looking forward to that as part of the San Diego Sound Project. Uh, David is a multi instrumentalist, composer, arranger, uh, and a music scholar uh, that is just fascinating to have a discussion with. We, he was actually one of our featured guests on our Mom at Home series. I hope you were able to catch that. If not, we're going to share the links on the show notes for today's episode. He's going to be here uh, tomorrow night with a band of wonderful, wonderful musicians. Uh, Julian Cantel on drums, Omar Lopez on bass, Zendu, Zendubis on piano, Tonga Ross Mau on guitar, and Patrick Paxton on flute, as well as Josh Gordon on kungas. Uh, but he will also be joined by a uh, Grammy Award winning producer producer Kamal Kenyatta, and we're very, very honored to have Kamal on today's episode of Show Notes as our special guest interviewer. So let's join everybody up together. Welcome, David. Welcome, Kamal. Thank you for joining us for Show Notes. Uh, we're going to take a look at what we're going to experience and, uh, uh, for tomorrow night's concert, but also take a look at your career, David, and I'm so happy that you and Kamal will help us uh travel down this narrative that we're going to explore today. So I'm going to leave it over to you guys and have fun. I'll be keeping an eye out on uh, our chat today, and I'll probably be interjecting on some uh, questions and excited, you know, uh, uh, exclamations on my own time, too. Wonderful. Thank you for having me, PJ. Well, thank you so much, PJ. Thank you. Okay. Uh, this is David Castaneda, PhD, a musician, composer, educator, and scholar. Uh, uh, the story goes that. When, um, when life that you would play here salsa a bunch of bunch uh, the, the first the first music that I I ever heard the that had a profound Luther effect Vandross, um, of course Oscar de Leon uh, my dad had a Uh, 69 Deville, Cadillac, Drop, America. They're from they're lots of stuff, a little bit of everything, you know. and of salsa music We're not, my, my dad played guitar when he was younger, but 
he had an accident. He broke his arm. He couldn't play. So instruments in the house. Uh, my first re first instrument was a recorder in fourth grade. Um, I remember learning how to play recorder. Uh, it was a trombone, trumpet, just a lot. Of theory. But something about the sound, you know, recording to the alto saxophone. Uh, elementary school, that obsessed. Uh, I, I, Thing. You know, I, I have a lot of fond memories of b having this feeling of Mr. Madrid playing something right on the instrument and then me thinking, oh, I'm not going to be able to do that. That's so hard. You know, that there's no way. How does he do that? I'm not going to be able to do it. And then you sit down with the instrument and you start continuously pushing yourself little by little. And you start really like, oh, wait a minute, I can do this. And then you do it and you remember, wow, I didn't think I was able to do this. What else can I do? I loved that feeling. That became to, to push, like pushing these boundaries, you know, pushing these, what I thought were limitations, self-imposed, I guess. Uh, and then I also love the uh, fact that, so that, you know, with music, right. you can't really well, do it alone. I wanted to ask you, you have to do it true. with other people. So I started making friends in music class and I kind of like convinced slash guilt tripped everybody to make little bands at recess, you know, in lunchtime. So I would have everybody meet at a certain place and I would like lead these little bands of all my friends. Um, and that also was really fun because it was just like this very collaborative kind of like we all in this together. Uh, I loved organizing the people together and us creating something cool together. It was like it, it was exhilarating, you know, in a, in, in a very cool way. Uh, so immediately I just kind of like dove into it. So that was my life for a long time. It was alto saxophone for many, many years uh, until middle school where I took a break. I didn't play anything. But in middle school, uh, I found a guitar in the attic in the house. And it was old. It had like three strings on it. And I started plucking out melodies. And I started realizing how beautiful the instrument guitar was. I was like, I really like this sound. And somehow I like, you know, begged my dad, oh, please, please give me a guitar. So he bought me a guitar from the flea market. You know, horrible action, you know, cut up all my fingers and everything. But I started learning a lot of triolos panchos just by ear. Because uh, I actually didn't really learn how to read music until much later. I, I, uh, everything I learned was by ear. Right. So we would look at the notes in class, but I would just learn all the parts by ear. Uh, I don't know. I was a terrible student. So <laughs> it was faster to learn it by ear than to read the notes, you know. So I started learning a bunch of Trio Los Panchos on guitar. Uh, and from guitar, that brought me into flamenco. And I got crazy about flamenco, super, super in flamenco. So I, I started uh, learning that there. And from flamenco, one of the instruments in flamenco is cajon which is, that was my, actually my first percussion instrument. So I started learning uh, cajon in middle school and I would like mow lawns, you know, and I probably shouldn't say this, but one of my cousins, he would, he would, uh, he would call his girlfriend and say, Hey, I want to play you some guitar. I'm thinking about you while he's hanging out with me. And he'd be like, okay, junior, go. everyone in my family calls me junior. It's like, okay, junior play, play guitar. So he would tell his girlfriend that he was playing guitar. And actually I was the one playing guitar and then he would pay me in CDs. So a lot of the, the first Paco de Lucia CDs that I got in Flamenco CDs were, that's how I worked for them. Um, I'm not too proud of that, but uh, I do have a lot of CDs, so I guess it worked out. Uh, so then that was, that was the, uh, the Flamenco. That's how I got into percussion. Um, and then after that, in high school, uh, by happen chance, one of, the, one of the dance teachers that was married to an Afro-Cuban Afro folkloric dancer Wow, that's a fascinating uh, and that ended story. Up being and when is the last time you played percussion. a saxophone? Because I've known you. What year did we meet? Do you remember? Wow. Okay. So, I, but I've never seen you uh, or heard you play you a saxophone. You don't want to. So, when's you the don't last want to. time? <laughs> <laughs> Years. Yeah. So, so although you play piano, you know, guitar, bass, and uh, you know, of course, uh, conga. I mean, that's you're primarily known for you know, conga and timbales. At what point did, I, you know, I, I heard you say that you, you started cajon because of flamenco, but when did you make that move to conga and timbales? Well, okay, so I was in high school, Miss Cooley's class. Miss Cooley, I miss you. Uh, Miss Cooley retired at San Lorenzo High, and um, 
uh, another a music teacher came in by the name of Mr. Draper. Mr. Draper, I hope you're listening to this because you've changed my life. Uh, Mr. Draper came in and Mr. Draper was fresh out of UCLA, UCLA Music School. He came to be our high school music teacher. And again, you know, like I was playing saxophone, but I was learning everything by ear. So I started realizing, oh, well, I can just kind of like jump around like the music room, right? There was an upright bass, there was drum set. Uh, so I would like jump around the class to learn the different instruments for the songs that we were playing. Uh, I was just curious about music. I just liked it. Um, and in the corner was this instrument that I had never touched before. I didn't, it looked odd. You know, I now know that it was a, like a circa 1970s gambop conga. Right. And it looked odd because the skin was old and, you know, it hadn't been touched in years, it hadn't been maintained. Um, but one of the songs was kind of like a Latin, Latin -y feeling song. And Mr. Draper goes, oh, well, why don't you why don't you play one of those instruments? It's called a conga. Oh, OK. So I started trying to figure it out. And I was like, this is odd. You know, this is weird. This is where the dance teacher comes comes to play because I was playing it little by little. And it just so happened that Miss Davis at San Lorenzo High. She was the dance teacher. Somehow we got connected. She says, oh, well, my dance classes I'm teaching right now for Cuban folkloric dance. And my husband, her husband at the time, uh, was Cuban. He was Afro-Cuban uh, dancer. So he was teaching all the dances to the classes along with her at high school. So somehow we got connected. And she's like, oh, you're a musician. Do you play conga? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I play conga. Yeah, why not? And the reason why I said that is because she said, if you do, then you can get out of class. So I'm like, yeah, I play conga. Let's go. You know, <laughs> get me out of class. So I would go to her dance classes and the the her husband would teach me all of these folkloric Afro-Cuban rhythms that they were dancing to. Uh, I now know that they were like bembe. Some of them were, uh, were like yesa, uh, makuta. And he would teach me this. And he would also have professional San Francisco Bay Area musicians come in and play with us. So that would be my first kind of like introduction into into Cuban music is learning that. And when I would go there to learn these patterns, I, re I just remember the rhythms being so, the music just being so incredible, 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 incredible music, this folkloric Afro-Cuban music. And that's when I really started to have a, a firm, firm kind of like, a, it was deeper than an interest. You know, I, I had found something very substantial and it started to kind of invade my uh, my headspace often. So I got really, really into it. And Mr. Draper, again, when he saw that I was taking this particular interest into Afro-Cuban percussion, him being the amazing educator that he was, he says, oh, hey, you know, one of my buddies is playing at Yoshi's, Yoshi's in Jack London Square, which will forever hold a very, very special place in my, my heart and in my life, because that's the place where, I mean, you know, this all this music stuff really started because up until up until now, in that point in my life, uh, my family had been pushing me to go into medicine. For all intents and purposes, I thought I was going to be a doctor. Uh, well, a medical doctor, right? Like I thought I was going to go be a surgeon or something. Uh, everybody in my family was pushing me that direction. I loved the sciences. I was all about the sciences. Um, I would, uh, probably shouldn't say this also, but like I, I would go to chemistry class and like finish all the work early uh and then she's teach my chemistry teacher guitar so we would, just, <laughs> we would we would jam during class right because i would finish all the work early and he'd be like okay well who will check it okay this is all good like well, what do you want to learn today oh teach me this so we would hang out in that kind of stuff the sciences were a huge part but so were music but it was very much leaning towards the sciences so so doc uh mr draper goes oh well my homie's playing in this band called fito reynoso y su son de cuba in in yoshi's let me take you and I thought, well, I mean, I'd never been to, you know, this was like a fancy place. We didn't grow up with a lot of money. So I thought this was like, you know, out of out of my league to, to go. Um, and he's like, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll pay the ticket. Don't, don't, don't trip. So he came to the house. He met my mom and he took me to this place. And for anyone who's ever been to Jack London, Yoshi's Jack London, it's just a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful venue. It's a, an amazing sushi spot. To the right, you walk into the door. To the right, it's this amazing sushi restaurant. And to the left is you walk to these doors, and it's just this incredible, intimate venue. Very, very, very intimate. Uh, and the chairs and the tables are set up in such a way where one of the, the tables in the front is hitting the stage. So when you look up, you're looking up at like the musicians. You're just, they're there. Very intimate. So we sit down, and he had one of the tables right in the front. And... Uh, 
we're sitting down, we're talking, and you know, I'm thinking, wow, this place is nice, this is cool, this is whatever. And then I just hear this, like, I think I talked about it before, this this like an otherworldly sound. It was just uh, that it was the rim shot of a timbal. Uh it was the timbalero from Orquesta Aragon, which is one of the premier, one of the most famous orchestras out of Cuba. And he started playing these timbales that the phrasing was just beautiful. It was just this pristine, pure Afro-Cuban phrasing on these instruments that were like simultaneously obnoxious and overpowering, overwhelming, while at the same time being sweet and inviting. It was just a crazy experience. The, one of those kind of experiences where like you're, I remember I was talking and you just kind of look up, you stop what you're doing, the hair stand up in the back of your head. And all I remember thinking was like, like I was just staring at him. I didn't know it was everything else fell away. And he was like, are you all right, man? Are you, are you good? And the only thing I remember telling him was, I want to do that. That's what I want to do. I want to do more of that. And I ended up doing it. And a year later, I, I be, after that point, I was obsessed, completely obsessed. I would, uh, I went in like mowed lawns and then bought some like crappy timbales and I would come home and try to figure everything out because I didn't have a teacher. So I would just get all this music and try to figure out all the bell patterns and how are they doing this? Uh, and I, uh, yeah, I would come home at like three or four and practice until two o'clock in the morning. I'm so happy no one called my my cops. For anyone who used to live around me, thank you so much for your patience because it would two, three o'clock in the morning, I would be practicing, 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 practicing. Finish all my work during the daytime so when I came home, I could practice. Uh, and a year and a half later, I was playing professionally. Uh, and sometime after that, I was playing professionally in the salsa circuit uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area with people like Hula Areas, Carlos Caro, uh, a bunch of people up there that, you know, after that, it, the rest is history. And then I met you soon after that, come on. <laughs> yeah, well, I, one more thing before, because I want to get to your academic work, uh, which is a really important part of what you do. Um, but I, I wanted to know, and you kind of hit on this a little bit in, um, yourself, but what, what ancillary positive effects um, are there um, for young people in being musicians and studying music, what, what do you feel, what other uh, uh, extra musical things did you gain by becoming a young musician? Well, so I can speak as an educator, as someone who's, as someone who's taught student musicians and students inside and outside the music discipline, right? Because I also, I got my doctorate in ethnomusicology, so a lot of ethnomusicological work isn't necessarily technical musical instruction, right? That is learning how to play an instrument. It's everything outside of that and that's associated with that. But what I, I, for me, it's the benefits as a person, as a human being, right? So my own was, you know, imagine being 16 years old, being snuck into all these clubs by these like 40 year olds, you know, uh, that was my first kind of foray, foray into music. 16 you don't really know anything you know and you're able to be around people who have lived essentially your lifetime right if not double your lifetime right um and you learn so many things from them just in terms of human beings you see so much the, on top of that you're constantly in humble mode you're never above right so there's always people on top of you telling you what you did wrong so what you learn from that is this constant ability to to take lessons and this constant feeling of, okay, I'm not good enough. Okay, I'm not good enough. Okay, I'm not good enough. But I can be. But I can be. And, and if you get into the right circles, you have all these older people who can do amazing things and you know they can do amazing things because you see them doing amazing things and they're telling you how to get there. So simultaneously, you're being broken down. You're being forced to really look at your own uh, shortcomings while at the same time being inspired to overcome those shortcomings, right? That's incredibly powerful. It, it gives you grit. It teaches you grit immediately. On top of that, what it does is it gives you, it affords you a space to interface with multiple cultures all at the same time sometimes, but also just in general. So it forces you, if you learn any kind of music, it's going to force you to interact with people that don't live on your same block, that aren't from your same city, that you know, if you take the route that I took, that you're going to have to learn music where they don't even speak the same language that you, spe you speak. I mean, a lot of, Bra I didn't grow up speaking Portuguese, but I 
got really into Brazilian music and I had to learn how to speak Portuguese to understand the music. Uh, to you know, to play Brazilian music, you're gonna have to hang out with Brazilians, you know. So you, it's constantly this this growth, this growth. It really like beats into you how to grow as a person and this mentality of constant growth. Which you know, if you're a musician, that's great. If you're a person, what occupation doesn't benefit from having a person who's constantly in growth? It's the applications are endless. And as a global citizen, who doesn't want to know how to respectfully and with nuance? Be able to engage with people from multiple cultural backgrounds and lived experiences it's the applications and the benefits are you know they're for me as an educator as a musician and as a person they're they're near endless it's something that uh can lend itself to creating better in my opinion just global citizens and and people active in a global community such that we can come together with the proper type of cohesion to build the society that we all want which is one that prides itself on, you know, harmony. Wow, well, wonderfully said. Well, let's move to uh, your academic work. And um, well, I was going to start with undergrad and not for any particular reason, but that's where, <laughs> we, <laughs> that's where we actually met. So talk about your experience at, at UCSD. And, uh, a little I, bit. Uh, well, I kind of cringe a little bit because um, when I first, okay, so when I first went to UCSD, I was right out of the salsa circuit in the San Francisco Bay Area. It was a bit brash. Um, I, I kind of, okay, so the, so for anyone who doesn't know uh, how Kamal and I first met and the tremendous amount of patience that Kamal and other faculty members at UCSD had for me. So one of the first times that we met, it was like a student faculty forum. So all the students get together at UCSD to meet each other, right? So the faculty's on the stage and the students are in, in the seating audience, right? Uh, and the the faculty introduces themselves and the students, the incoming students, the new students were supposed to introduce themselves as well. So all the other students were very respectful. You know, oh, my name is such and such. I'd really like to learn such and such instrument. Oh, my name is such and such. I'm really interested in such and such type of music. And I remember I got up and I'm like, my name is David Castaneda. I play congas. If y'all are trying to jam, I'm down to pointing to the, <laughs> to the professors and all the professors kind of like, you know, their eyes got big. They're like, oh, no, who do we let in? And then I saw Kamal laugh and I'm like, OK, I got a good feeling about this guy. <laughs> uh, so then uh, I was talking with Eileen Boriades, who was the uh, student advisor um, when I first got there. Um, I miss Eileen so much because she I mean, without her, I wouldn't have gone through undergrad. She was a godsend. Um, and I told Eileen what I wanted to study and what the situation was, is that I had been writing music for, since I started professionally as a musician, that was the whole reason why I went to college in the first place that I thought to myself, well, you know, if I'm going to, if I'm going to continue writing music and if I'm serious about music, then what I need to do is I need to learn how to read. I need to learn this theory stuff because by that point I still didn't even really know how to read. Everything was by ear. And I remember thinking to myself, well, this isn't right. You know, this is not professional. I can't be going into recording sessions and having people singing things at me or me singing things to people. It's not right. So I got to make the decision and make the commitment to go to school and do this if I'm going to do it right. So I ended up at UCSD uh, and I told Eileen what I, my previous experiences, right? And my professional experiences. And she goes, okay, well, the person you need to talk to is Kamal, Kamal Kenya. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, why is that? She's like, well, He's, he's a faculty here. He's wonderful. He has a lot of experience. Uh, he's, he himself is a multicultural educator. He's in, in, interested in a lot of different types of music. And he also teaches 95JC, which is the performance ensemble here. You should talk to him. All right. So then I, I walk over, you know, and another cringy moment, you know, I walk in and come out, I was just finishing 95JC. And I, here walks in this dude, you know, me, and I just sit there waiting. You know, so <laughs> waiting to talk to Kamal. And I'm like, yeah, I'm trying to play for you. You know, and Kamal's like, what do you even play? I'm like, oh, I'll play conga. Oh, Kamal's like, all right, well, go ahead. And like, you know, there's a conga in the back once you get it. And then we'll see, you know. So I get the conga out and I start playing a little bit and, you know, all loud or whatever. And Kamal's like, okay, 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 okay. Hey, come on Monday. Come on. <laughs> come on Monday. So that was the first time I met Kamal. And then from there, I'm very grateful to say that from there, we just kind of like clicked and, and Kamal, I found someone not only who was a tremendous educator and has molded me 
in many ways, you know, as a musician, but also as a person and has become very much of a mentor in many, many different ways. I'm extremely grateful. Um, and yeah, and my career started at UCSD really taking all of the lessons that I learned uh, in the Bay, right? So in the Bay, to backtrack a little bit, the first person to really uh, give me a shot was this guy, Leo Servin, who I'll always be incredibly grateful for. This guy kind of took me under his wing and saw like a young kid trying to learn the, this is when I first got into the salsa scene. He kind of took me in. The next person after that is a tremendous, tremendous musician, Julio Areas, who he himself, he studied with Changuito, Giovanni, Anga. Uh, he taught me all of this, all, all of the things that I know, all the, cu the Cuban music traditions. Um, he's actually coming out with an album really soon. I'm co-producer in that album. And he has just amazing things with some incredible musicians from San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, and then I met Kamau, and I made the focus of my undergraduate career at UCSD trying to synthesize all of this while at the same time, you know, learning uh, all the technical aspects of actually running a band, which is composition arrangement, chart writing, you know, all this different kind of stuff that I studied with Kamau and also people like David Borgo, Mark Dresser, Anthony Davis, Charles Curtis. You know, these people have been incredibly influential. Uh, and of course, Kamau, incredibly, incredibly influential. That was my undergrad. Wow. So let's talk about, um, you know, the masters and the PhD. I think those are they're pretty discreet in your case because they were done at two different schools and and they're two different programs, if if I'm not mistaken, right? Two different programs. So the first one was at Cal State LA. This one was at uh, it was in a master's in music for Afro Latin music. So this was under Dr. Paul Castro. Um, I had the wonderful pleasure of also studying percussion with uh, Euro Sambrano, who is, uh, he's, he's played percussion with Stevie Wonder and many, many others, uh, and also Calixto Oviedo. Calixto Oviedo is like cream of the crop, amazing, amazing, amazing musician, wonderful person. He played with Angela Banda for many years, a tremendous uh, percussionist and drum set player. I was studying primarily arrangement under Dr. Paul Castro, um, and, and of course, uh, writing and, and things like this. It wasn't very, uh, it wasn't so heavy on the, like the research side. So that was the two years in, Af uh, two years, Masters of Music, Afro Latin Music. The second program I did was at um, UCLA. This was an ethnomusicology. This was an MA PhD program. So this was the second masters and the PhD. This was an ethnomusicology. So then what I focused on in this program was taking all of the kind of musical experience that I had and really focusing on everything surrounding the music. So the big thing with ethnomusicology is you're not just focusing on what the music is and how the music is produced or the technical aspects of the music. You're really focusing on what the music means to the people who keep that music. Uh, and this is where I, I got really, really into polyculturalism towards the tail end of my graduate study there uh, because I think it's just incredibly beneficial. It's, it's beneficial for understanding how music moves, but it's also beneficial for understanding how people more and more are operating within one another across cultural boundaries. Um, it also is incredibly beneficial for understanding how people can inhabit many different cultural spaces all at once, or rather those cultures existing within one person all at once. This is work spearheaded by Robin, uh, Robin Kelly at UCLA, but also Vijay Prashad. Um, and I, what I did is I took those frameworks and those ideas and I looked at six musicians, uh, Edge Moata from Brazil, Joyce Moreno from Brazil, Lupita Infante, who is the granddaughter of Pedro Infante, uh, Etienne Charles from Trinidad and Tobago, Miguel Zanon. Uh, what I was looking for really is how these musicians are constantly listening to everyone else, while at the same time allowing those influences in to propel them and inspire them in their own ways. Daime Arosena, who's also a fantastic, amazing, amazing Afro-Cuban folkloric singer, but she does jazz. Her music in and of itself is exactly what we're talking about here. How can you take this very strong Afro folklore tradition, also fuse it with jazz and have it connect with so many people in such a direct way? So I interviewed all of them and wrote my dissertation primarily on that, on polyculturalism and, and, and also and, the issues inherent with doing something like that, which can be many. So you got to interview these, that's a fairly impressive uh, list of musicians. Uh, maybe we'll get, get you to write all that down so the so the museum can share that because that that I mean a lot of people who haven't heard Joyce Moreno for instance and, and others should you know really take a listen to their music Edgy Malta a super interesting Brazilian uh, musician who and I've also had the pleasure of working with him um yeah maybe we'll get you to 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 share that somehow BJ you know 
that'd be really cool. I'd be, I'd uh, be happy to share all those. Yeah, that's that's. I mean, I, I think in in one of our conversations earlier, I'd, I'd mentioned to, to David just how compartmentalized my own experience outside the you know what I'm used to, what the musical languages that I'm used to, and I, I was like, I got to break free from that. And, and any opportunity there is to learn about different languages of music we're you know happy to share those here in the museum and personally myself i'm always very interested to to break through my own my own little capsules that i put up too so it's it's i'm excited to hear about those those artists yeah amazingly uh joycey performed at the museum of making music i mean we uh all of us and i i won't speak well i will speak for david in this case i mean <laughs> we really uh, we really appreciate what the museum does and, and how it the, the kind of people that it's it's brought to the San Diego area, um, it's a fairly impressive list. I mean, people people that don't know. I mean, I I could be really quick and mention uh, Baila Casey Soko and 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 Vincent Herring. Incredible. That's a duet between uh, uh, a cellist and and a chora player from Mali, and and many many others. Um, Lionel Lueke, Mavis mm-hmm. Staples. You've presented some incredible music, um, and and we're uh, we're beyond appreciative. And through those uh, opportunities, that's where I met Joycey. And I mean, again, the museum enabled. I met Joycey. I knew a lot about her music. I've been listening to her for fifty years or something. And she's so such a brilliant musician, and 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 beyond music, very kind of in tune with world affairs. But anyway. I, I started corresponding with her, kept in touch with her, and when David um, got ready to do this 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 thesis, I said you should interview her, and I reached out to her, and she said yes, I'll I'll talk to him. All of that is because of the Museum of Making Music. Well, I'd be, all... I would be I would be remiss to say if we, it it wouldn't be possible for the museum to do without the support from you know experts and you know people with a deep knowledge uh, and connections like like you come out and like connecting us with people like David. I mean, it's all, it, it, in my mind, it's all a big family and we're just, you know, we have extended families and we maybe not, maybe have some relatives over here we haven't met yet, but you get to meet this family of musicians and artists and, and just the the deep knowledge that we all share together. And you know, who knows who we'll get to meet next and who we'll, who we'll get to discover through, you know, advocates for music like like yourselves. Thank you. And and it has real world impact. And, you know, David, uh, is someday the, the hope is to do a book uh, based on some of these interviews. Right, David? And and there are when will you um, share videos from that project? Or I mean, if, if, if I'm not I hope I'm not putting you on the spot. But I, no, will that put me be on the spot. Put me on the spot. <laughs> will that be spot. Be available good. for public consumption or what, what do you. So the, the current. The current plan now is to let COVID die down a little bit and to make it into a documentary. That's my plan. Mm-hmm. So I'm not entirely interested in writing a book. I'm very much interested in uh, kind of branching out into filmmaking and to doing a documentary working with. Uh, so if anyone knows any directors that would be interested in something like this, uh, I would love to make this into a documentary because I believe in the power of film as an educational tool. Um, and yeah, so they would be it would be that medium that all of this would be, uh, of course, disseminated through right because all everything in the dissertation would be used in the documentary so very okay. soon i just Let want it to just be safe say that david looks really great on camera because he's already <laughs> helped the museum out with our our, our stem and steam uh, projects we we use for our virtual tour, field trips for the uh, um, the elementary school grades and so they get to see his face and talking about the science of sound and it's it's already he's already proven himself as somebody who is engaging and, and whatnot so i mean i'm 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 definitely looking forward to these future uh film forays for you okay i mean uh, let's i, I want to get back to david i mean he's a young guy but man th- th- he's done a lot of work so <laughs> i i got a lot more stuff to cover actually uh, can can we talk a little bit about your your studio your work as a your work in the recording studio i think people might be interested for first um you know, whenever I do, um, when I can, when I'm producing sessions, as I'm often ca- called to do, if I need percussion, um, and it's not because I love him or anything, this guy can play and he can also give you give you what you want. Um, David is my first call for percussion. 
And and I wanted to t- you to talk a little bit about um, the this, the jazz sessions we've done. I guess many together, um, but there's Alan Harris, Paulette McWilliams, um, Deneen Wilburn. I, I feel like there's there might even be more, but uh, and we've done some work, uh, some soundtrack work together. Mm-hmm. Would you talk a little bit about that process, re- recording, and yeah. working in those that context? Absolutely. So I, I think the first thing I want to say is, you know, what for me when Kamal called me to do the Paulette album that to me was like you know one of the first earliest musics that i've ever like remember like i said just in this interview was luther vandross you know so paulette williams worked with luther that was luther's singer so i had had paulette's voice in my head for years for years so when kamal's like hey man so i i I mean you know there's this there's this uh studio gig coming up as well paulette mcwilliams and i'm like what did you just say what do you want me to do? You want me to get caught? What do you want me to do? I'll do anything. You know, what do you, what do you want me to do? He's like, no, no, I want you to play percussion. Absolutely. I'll be there. You know? So then I meet Paulette and she's just such a wonderful person and a tremendous singer, you know? So being able to work with her is, was just, you know, mind blowing, you know, and, and then come out the, the way where I really learned how to be a professional musician and how to lead rehearsals and lead sessions was under come out. So when Kamal leads something, you know, it's you come in and it's efficient, super efficient, efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. So being able to to work in that kind of like high pressure creative environment, while at the same time you got one take to give you something good, you know, I, I learned that under Kamal. Um, so and it stayed with me, you know, that that type of work ethic. You know, we're here to work, we're not here to have fun. You know, well everything's fun, but we're here to work, we're not here to like waste time. Uh, this kind of like directed creativity, I really really enjoy. I, I love studio work. And of course, being able to work with tremendous musicians like Paulette, Alan Harris, amazing singer, amazing, amazing singer with such such a unique voice, uh, creative style, sound, tremendous, 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 tremendous experiences. Joe Garrison too. We did Joe Garrison stuff come out way back in the way back in the day. And Joe, I mean, genius arranger. I mean, that I was, I don't know what I was. I was in my early 20s. And every time I would get, I remember I would look at the music and I would be shaking. Because it's hard music, you know, <laughs> it's hard and you, know, believe it. you know, and it's it's but it's incredible, yeah. incredible music. And I would be shaking because I would think I don't want to mess this up. I can't mess this up. You know, Kamal asked me to do this. I love Joe. Joe, I can't mess this good music. I'm not gonna be the one that messes this good music up. So it was just tremendous pressure to play this beautiful, beautiful music. We recorded that. Um so I mean Zenibu Davis's film soundtrack that was tremendous as well. Working with people like Richard Sellers and you know the usual suspects here in San Diego, tremendous. Uh, yeah, I mean it's you know Kamal, you've you've uh, invited me to a lot of these projects. You know they've all just been tremendous learning experiences. Uh, most of all, how to conduct oneself, right? Because again, I was like going back to what I said before. Um, I was always the the often the youngest one in these sessions. So not only was I there to do a job, but I was also there to learn. And that was something that was very apparent to me very quickly that, you know, you walk in, you don't really say that much. You're there to do something. You're not there to make friends. Um, in that sense, you know, like you're, you, you can, you can socialize once you do the work right, you know, and you go in, you do the work right. You do it, you do it good and you do it well and you don't say much, you get it done. And uh, these kind of experiences have molded me, molded me into who I am today. Oh man, recording with Hubert Laws was like, I don't, you know, like we've often said, come out. It's 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 so crazy to to share space with people who are the best at what they do in the world. It's what it's a surreal experience. You know, it's I didn't have the pleasure of recording with him, but it was kind of the same thing of when I brought a uh, Jose Luis. Quintana Changuito down to UCSD at the loft and we got to hang and all this just sharing space with someone like that it was incredible and one of the people that I got to record with on one of these Kamal sessions with Hubert Laws I also had the uh through Kamal I was able to also interview Hubert Laws for my master's thesis at UCLA um it's yes yeah, it's, it's been wonderful and I'm, I'm very proud of all the work that I've done under Kamal in these different recording sessions uh and they've been also tons of fun <laughs> So, I mean, when you talk about Hubert and I, I, I should, for people who are not familiar with Hubert, you've probably heard him without knowing you've heard him because if you heard a flute on a record that was jazz or, or popular music, 
from the late 60s, you know, on, it's a good chance it's Hubert Laws. I mean, he recorded with Chick Corea, Aretha Franklin. Um, I mean, imagine that, <laughs> those two names, Antonio Carlos Jobim, um, et cetera. And he is, as David said, the, the greatest, I, I don't think there'd be much debate that he's the greatest jazz flute player in history. And his, but his, as, as David was kind of hitting on with the, the idea of a, a polyculturalism, I believe, that Hubert plays Afro-Cuban music, he plays straight ahead jazz, he plays uh, kind of a contemporary smoother jazz style, he played with Aretha Franklin, and he played classical duets with Jean-Pierre Rampal. I mean, he's a, 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 an incredible classical musician. He's recorded um, the music of the great French composers, etc. And I remember, I listen, I've listened to Hubert since I was 12 years old. Of course, Hubert was a success very early in life. He got a full scholarship to Juilliard at 16 after playing the flute for two years, which that, that was revealed to me in, in, in David's interview of Hubert. Um, but anyway, um, so... I was 12 listening to Hubert Laws. Hubert was only 27, and he already had his career going, playing with people like Milton Nascimento, Antonio Carlos Jobim from Brazil, and others. And it's funny because when I work with Hubert, I'm, I'm just kind of amplifying what David said. Somehow I still feel like that 12-year-old kid when, <laughs> when I'm in the room with him, and I, I just, and I'm, I remember, man, he just, you know, a couple, two weeks ago, he played with, Chick Corea, or not, not now, of course, but at the, the last time we recorded, you know, he was still recording with Chick Corea or Herbie Hancock. And I knew he had worked with McCoy Tyner. And now I'm sitting at the piano. And it, like David said, you just don't want to disappoint him. You don't want to disappoint yourself. And there's this incredible responsibility when you play with great musicians who David said it even better as usual. I mean, he said, when you share space with these people, when you share space with a Hubert Laws or a Changuito or something like that, even if it's dinner, <laughs> you're, you're sitting there wa wanting to, to say the right thing, do the right thing. And if it's music, you want to play the right thing. And I never want to disappoint Hubert. And um, so, yeah, that's an interesting um, perspective on, on studio work. Thanks. Thanks so much for sharing that, David. Again, David has done so many things that I, I got to keep moving. He could talk a lot more about studio work, but what about these? I know some other in interests of yours that you've shared with me um, include podcasting, production, and, and even marketing music. Would you talk about that a bit? Yeah, absolutely. So, so, so in order. So the first thing that uh, when I was at UCLA, UCLA, a lot of the work that I was doing had to do with communities. Um, had to do with understanding how the music was re reflecting lived experiences. That's where a lot of these ideas that I have now about the arts and their their weight in society really started to form, right? Because my time before UCLA was incredibly focused on the technical aspect of the production of music. How can I play this better? Um, what What do I need to write so it sounds a certain way? And then I started realizing, well, you know, the other side of that is how are the people listening to it? What are the things in the music that are resonating with people? And I started realizing that the arts as a whole is more a statement, if anything, of I was here rather than who they are, right? So for me, what I started then shifting my focus to was, okay, well, how can I amplify this statement of I was here? So what I said is, well, I love the, the medium of podcasting. So the best thing for me to do is to start a podcast. So I started this podcast, People Plus Art. It's on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, all the, the major outlets. And what I do is I just interview musicians, but also uh, visual artists, anyone in the arts, right? Also people who own, uh, I want to focus on people who own galleries and uh, people who provide the spaces for artists to do what they do so that people can come in and experience that art. Because for me, Art is much more than just, like I said, expression or products, right? It's it's this ability, this this moment for people to see themselves and what it is that they're hearing or seeing. And that connection can be incredibly cathartic. But on top of that, when you have multiple people experiencing that same connection, then you can have opportunities for community building. 
And when you have community building, then that's when you can have communal support. That's when you can have people developing a sense of place to their life and not just individuality. Both are important. We're, none of us are alone in any of this. So if you don't have a people, if you don't have a community, then you can be very alienated. And that in and of itself goes against who we are as a species, right? As human beings, as spirits, we're, we're very, very connected things, creatures. So community is incredibly, incredibly, incredibly impo important. There is no art without community. So the podcast focused on what these people are doing. Uh, the next episode that's going to be released is Bernard Ellerin. So he's also an ethnomusicologist. He focuses on the folkloric music of the Philippines. The one after that is uh, actually uh, is Andre Kamau. Uh, that's going to be the next. Uh, he's an incredible, incredible uh, organist. So what I want to do is I want to really use that podcast to amplify and celebrate these people's work and celebrate their life and, and what they who they are as people before artists right and also give an opportunity and a platform for people to perhaps learn something about them they didn't know or come into contact with a type of music that they hadn't heard yet uh, so that is continuing uh, like i said i am working as co-producer for julio areas's project no se acabo uh, that project is going to be fantastic because it's it's what it does is it it's kind of going telling the story of Julio Arias's family's legacy. His uncle was actually the first original timbalero for Santana, Chepito Arias. Uh, and that family lineage goes back hundreds of years, and there's a lot of musical history there. Julio Arias himself, though, is a tremendous musician that not only studied with Changuito, Anga, Giovanni Hidalgo, but also with I mean, all kinds of musics he's he's kind of thrown himself into from a very young age so he's a tremendous percussionist also a fantastic writer he's working with marco diaz uh, also in the bay area and they're putting together an album that features kind of the cream of the crop in the san francisco bay area there's carl parazzo is going to be on it he says jesus diaz uh everybody the who's who i don't want to get too much into it because we're still working on it right but that's going to come out soon a lot of that production work very very much excites me um, I've also been doing marketing work as well. I've been working with uh, people like the House of Music that are doing incredible things right now uh, that I highly recommend they check out um, houseofmusic.com. The House of Music is a nonprofit down here in San Diego. I've also been working with uh, the Regalado Foundation in Los Angeles, uh, and we're going to be having some more incredible things coming this year too. A lot of the stuff is under wraps. You know, you don't want to like uh, pop it too soon. Uh, with Ernie Becker, where we have some amazing things in, in the work. So I just try to stay busy as much as possible. Everything in the arts to me is incredibly meaningful. Uh, most of all, using the arts as a, as a way to create these spaces for people to build community, also helping the youth. Um, and most of all, just having people develop this really diverse, kind of like a multifaceted sense of what I call polyculturalism, which is many, many different cultures all coming together. Um, and being able to interface with all of them, you know, openly, right, with respect and with nuance, uh, that I think is the key to creating, you know, a, a, a cohesive global community. BJ, how are we doing time-wise? We're coming up about the top of the hour right now. I know we got a little bit of a late start today, so I mean, I'm I would love to hear more about um, if we could kind of talk uh, about what to expect tomorrow night, because I know you're bringing some some excellent musicians come out included into the into the uh, concert room at the Museum of Making Music is can we talk for a bit about what what our guests will be experiencing that night what type of uh, styles and influences you're going to be presenting with the band absolutely so <clears throat> so this music um, it's so they're all original so some of these uh, some of these songs are close to eight years old um, they're or at least I should say I wrote them one of them is like I wrote them eight years. I wrote this one eight years ago, and I've continued to work on it. Uh, so, like I said, when I first started along this career, in my career, the impetus was to write music. That's that's what I wanted to do. Um, that's why I went to UCSD to learn how to write music. And then it just so happens that you know life kind of happens, and it almost seems like I went away from that. You know, so I continued playing, and I never stopped writing. But none of my music, none of this, actually has has gotten out. Uh, first it was the first masters and it was the PhD, which was like, you know, a lot of work. I got busy. So, uh, but I never stopped writing all of this. You know, I have a, a song book of like close to, it's like at this point, it's over a hundred songs that I just never stopped writing. I was always writing. Um, so all of the music with the exception of one song is original. They're all songs that I've written along the course, you know, the last 10 years. Um, 
they're a mix of all the musics that I love, right? So a lot of it is Afro-Cuban and Cuban influence, Cuban, Cuban popular music, dance music. Uh, there's a lot of Pagoji in there, popular Brazilian music, Bossa Nova influences. Uh, one of them is a bolero that I wrote that's uh, kind of within the same style of Trio Los Panchos and Romantico music, you know, this kind of stuff. Um, there's um, funky stuff, you know, stuff you can bob your head to a lot of it. Uh, there's, of course, going to be dance music for anyone who dances salsa. So there's going to be parts where you can dance to those uh, in the set. I mean, you're going to be able to dance and have a good time. Um, for anyone listening to this is coming tomorrow, please don't show up expecting to be quiet. That's it's not one of those kind of nights. If you like something, be loud because us musicians are going to be able to feed off that. This that's what this kind of night is. Uh, this is a night. This is a celebratory night, right? This is this is who we are. Is loud music. Be loud with us. Uh, I couldn't be happier with the with the band that um, I was able to get. You know, uh, Julian Cantel on drums, who to me is the number one drummer that I love to work with. He's tremendous. He knows all different kinds of styles and he plays all of them incredibly and with taste and with finesse and with efficiency, you know, economy. It's tremendous, tremendous, tremendous musician. Of course, Kamal Kenyatta, who to have him on my gig is like, I'm, you know, I'm done. You know what I mean? Okay. That's it. That's it. So happy. Uh, Tonga Rasmal, who's like, Another one of these guys that you, you tell him to play anything and he's just so good at everything. You know, and you think, well, how do you get that good at everything? You can be good at one thing, but you're good at everything. Every instrument, you're so good. So he's playing a, a guitar, electric and acoustic guitar. Couldn't be happier to have him on the gig. I, 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 I don't mean to interrupt before because I oh, no, know please. these this set of musicians that you just named are, are musicians that we are familiar with that are good friends of the museum and we know that they're advocates of music. We know that they're passionate about music and about education and about creating that space where people can express themselves. The 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 artists that you have that you haven't mentioned yet, they're they're going to be new faces for us. So I'd like to hear a lot more about them too, as well how they how they are in your uh, in your fold. Wonderful, yeah. So uh, Omar Lopez, Omar Lopez is a tremendous tremendous bassist and musician. He also composer, band leader. He's amazing. He's one of the one of the guys that you know. One of the the we call them boogeymen in the bay. You know, boogeymen because they don't say much and they just handle business. And you're kind of like, oh my goodness, you know, like one of these kind of one of one of these kind of uh, people in the band that you love having in the band because you don't have to worry about. It. They're gonna kill everything. It's gonna be amazing and it's sound wonderful and a tremendous person. Someone who's incredibly interested and supportive of community, especially community here in San Diego, which I am incredibly appreciative of. Um, he is tremendous. We have uh, a young a young musician who I've just been incredibly impressed with, Zen Dubis, who is actually one of Kamau's students. Uh, this, this kid is just incredible. You know, I gave him this, this is hard music. And he showed up to the rehearsal, calm as a cucumber, playing everything down, not saying a word, another boogeyman, you know? So He's at 16, such a, by the way, he's oh, 16. Wow. That's 16 fantastic. and a boogeyman. So it's uh, he's wonderful to have him, Patrick Passon on flute. I know it's just wonderful, another wonderful, wonderful musician. I'm very, very lucky and very grateful to have also my good friend and community icon, salsa dancing community icon here in San Diego, Josh Gordon, who's going to be playing congas for one of the tunes. He's a, another person who just kind of like, you know, he came here. And he, he's the one who leads an event called Salsa on the Beach. It's every third Saturday. He just brings a speaker out and has created this community of dancers uh, that come out for free. So if you ever want to learn how to dance salsa or just hang out with amazing people, it's every third Saturday once the weather, you know, weather permitting. Um, that's Josh Gordon. That's his project. Another just person who values community and, and a wonderful, wonderful soul. Uh, I'm very, very happy to have him as a friend and a fellow musician on this, on this gig. Um, the band is tremendous, you know, so it's almost it's almost difficult to talk about it because now I got to go practice after this. You know, I got to make sure I'm going to be on on point <laughs> to not let these musicians down. There's tremendous talent on stage for tomorrow night. So I couldn't be more excited. Couldn't be happier. Fantastic. Fantastic. Kamal, that's all I had. Is there anything you wanted to kind of uh, end with to wrap up? No, I just want to invite everybody to join us um, tomorrow and keep an eye on. on um, I, I implore everyone to keep an eye on. Uh, David Castaneda, uh, not just for tomorrow, but but for the future, uh, he's going to do great things in the world. I, I I knew that when I when I first met him, and he's done nothing but prove me right over and over again. So, 
That's all I have. Wonderful. I'm going to actually give our, uh, our guests a preview of what's going on, so I'm going to switch my screens over here. And, yes, tomorrow night, David Castaneda with his band of uh, phenomenal musicians, which you just heard about, Saturday, February 26th. Uh, the concert will start at 7 p.m. It's part of our San Diego Sound Project event, uh, sponsored and supported in part by the Conrad Prebis Foundation. And uh, we're very, very fortunate to have that uh, occurring here tomorrow night. You can get tickets uh, on our website, museumofmakingmusic.org. If you're unable to attend in person, we do have a free live stream option. Uh, you can RSVP for, RSVP for that uh, online on our website, and um, we'll send you the link after you go ahead and RSVP. So check out both of those resources on our website. Uh, if you want to come in person, come hear some amazing music. And it sounds like there's going to be some a little bit of dancing and celebration. Or uh, We can get a little rowdy. It's okay. We're going to leave some space to get rowdy at the museum. Uh, or if you're not able to make it to San Diego or Carlsbad, uh, feel free to sign up for the live stream, and we'll uh, get you taken care of. I want to, again, thank our, our guest, David, and our guest interviewer, Kamal, for joining us today. Um, I, 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 I was telling all my coworkers, and I was telling David earlier how I was just going to be excited to see this this conversation take place with such a wonderful relationship that, that you two have. And I uh, appreciate you being here for our, our show notes. And uh, for anybody that's going to be joining us tomorrow, we encourage you to gra grab those tickets. We're going to have a fun time tomorrow night. Until then, uh, take care, everyone, uh, and go enjoy some live music. And we hope to see you at the Museum of Making Music. The San Diego Sound Project was made possible in part by the Conrad Prebis Foundation. Additional support for live streaming was provided by the City of Carlsbad Cultural Arts Office. For more information about this program or any upcoming San Diego Sound Project,